mean, I've heard some men, even though I know they say, you know, light skinned women are always preferred. They say light skinned women have a horrible attitude. We're stuck up. We're conceited. You know, we're all about ourselves. So we're not good partners. Right. So those are some things that people really attribute. And it's not just a preference. Right. So you're not just embracing or appreciating darker skin because it's beautiful. It's because you feel like the other side has all these negative characteristics. I know when I was uh, like high school, college, you know, there was always like hashtag team light skin, team dark skin, like wow. that kind of thing. And it's like, it has, those messages are there, right? As subtle as it, as maybe it seems, it's still really insidious in nature of its impact. I mean, that's still harmful. Wow. And yeah. so like when I'm working with my clients who are um, darker complexed and they're talking about, you know, feeling low self-esteem, feeling undesirable, feeling unwanted, it kind of goes back of like we're peeling back these layers of okay where did this come from fear you know a world where my daughter who's like me when she does all of this because that's what she do now she girl she's six girl <laughs> who is she talking to girl when she does all of that it's funny and it's cute but if my brown skin daughter does that it's disrespectful mm. i can't <laughs> I can't settle for a world like that. I can't settle for a world where both of my daughters, who are equally brilliant and talented, where my lighter skinned daughter, who's only a year younger than her sister, um, where doors are more available for her. I, I can't, I don't know, I can't, I'm, I'm just not okay with that. That hurts in my spirit. Colorism. Is this still a thing? Something that we still dealing with in this day and age. Sometimes, you know, you think that it would have played out by now and everybody would have just been able to sing, you know, Kumbaya and we would just all be one big happy family. But it's still an issue today from relationships to the uh, workforce um, in different arenas of life that colorism is still present. And we want to talk about that in this segment of 40s Unfiltered. What's up, Jason? How you doing today, man? What's going on, bro? <laughs> just, just living the dream, man. Living the dream. I'm good, man. 40s Unfiltered, you haven't heard a conversation like this. We have special guests with us today. She is yes, a sir. She is a speaker, a trauma therapist, relationship trauma expert, and brain spotting clinician. How are you doing, Tierra? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm really excited for this conversation. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you so much. And we also have influencer, creator, and she has more than 25,000 subscribers on YouTube. One day I want to be like her when I grow up. How are you doing, Tanisha? I'm good. It's always a good day when I'm surrounded with beautiful Black people. So I'm excited. It'll be a good conversation. <laughs> yes, for sure. Thank you both for taking some time out of your busy day. I want to jump into this topic of colorism. And I wanted to ask from your professional perspective, have you seen colorism play out in, in your field of work? And anyone feel open to uh, talk about that, whether through their experiences or anything that they've seen. Like, have you seen colorism play out in, in your own personal experiences? Mm, yeah, definitely in working with the clients. And, you know, I mostly work with uh, Black men and Black women. <clears throat> and a lot of times in working with, like, that has come up, working with darker skinned women, um, they're how they're feeling about their skin tone. Um, how is that impacting their day-to-day -day life? So yes, I've definitely seen it. Mm -hmm. And it's sad that we would still have that, that struggle today, considering with media and stuff like that, we have, um, you know, cause like chocolate is in, right? You know, everybody talk about that, but it still seems like it's a struggle, uh, unfortunately. Um, how about you, Jason? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Like, if, if you had an order, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm no sorry. Worries. Any Yeah. Anybody that want to go up? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Tanisha. Ladies first. Jason, we'll, we'll, we'll catch up with you. I'm yes, sorry. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. 
Um, yeah, I think it's interesting for me because I, based on Tierra's experience with her clients, I feel like I'm on the opposite side of the spectrum. So I'm very aware that I'm a person that a lot of people would say benefits from colorism. So I can't say that I've had the discrimination from others because of my skin tone. However, there have been some questions or questioning my blackness that comes up a lot. So whenever I have videos where I'm talking about black dynamics, people will be like, you're not even black. Are you mixed? Like, what are you? You know, things like that kind of questioning my viewpoint on things because I am lighter complected. Yeah, I had, a, um, I guess, a follow up question with that, um, guys, and you can just jump in whenever you um, feel led to. Uh, but my question was um, uh, for uh, Tierra, because you're in the mental health uh, health care um, field. Um, so. Could you elaborate a little bit more on as far as what you've seen in the um, mental health field and healthcare field? Mm -hmm, yeah, so definitely. Um, and just my work with clients, like working with, you know, some darker skin uh, women, um, the impact of maybe there is like some low self-esteem of uh, feelings of depression, feelings of feeling unlovable or unwanted or undesirable based on their skin tone. And a lot of this coming from messages received, you know, over the years. And I think that kind of goes back to the programming that exists um, because, you know, I mean, if we're talking about colorism, you know, it didn't start with us. Sorry, this really came from the overarching of racism, really. And so when we're thinking about how much that has leaked into our society when it comes to just us as black people, how that has trickled down into putting us kind of against each other. Like, you know, I know when I was uh, like high school, college, you know, there was always like hashtag team light skin, team dark skin, like wow. that kind of thing. And it's like, it has, those messages are there, right? As subtle as it, as maybe it seems, it's still really insidious in nature of its impact. I mean, that's still harmful. Wow. And yeah. so like when I'm working with my clients who are um, dark and complexed and, they're talking about, you know, feeling low self-esteem, feeling undesirable, feeling unwanted. It kind of goes back of like we're peeling back these layers of, OK, where did this come from? And it really stems from this subliminal messaging um, that has been pushed out in our media and our entertainment and mu music and movies and all of these things. And even just like their day to day experiences, because you're also probably interacting with another black person who's also been programmed to yeah. have these implicit subconscious biases that dark is not as good or not as desirable. And so that adds to those experiences, maybe there was some bullying that happened in childhood with some name calling based on their skin tone. That also plays a role because that sticks to somebody sometimes. And so working with my clients who've experienced that side of the spectrum where like now they're experiencing some low self-esteem, finding it hard to embrace their skin tone, hard to finding it to be empowered by their skin color. Um, those are types of things that I've seen. Is that something that you have to tread lightly on as far as um, helping them uh, recover from that type of like mindset and trauma? Uh, because I know when you're dealing with racism and colorism and things like that, um, and you're dealing with any type of thing, it can be something that you might have to tread lightly lightly on as far as your profession. Um, you have to circle around with the questioning or like helping you like, so what is your method, you know, when you're approaching situations like that, that you would have to do? Yeah, so I mean, let's like, like, let's do an example, like a little case study, right? So like, I don't know, let's say there's like a 25 year old dark skinned woman coming in. Maybe she's got some low self-esteem, some anxiety, right? I would probably be mm -hmm. like, you know, ask questions around like, okay, where did this come from for you? Where did this start? Like, what is your mind telling you about yourself that where you're not seeing yourself as beautiful or worthy, right? And then maybe that opens up to, mm, well, I don't really like my skin tone or, you know, maybe I wish I was lighter or, you know, I don't really feel as, as desired by, by men or, or women or whatever um, because of this. And it's like, okay, well, let's talk about it. Like, where did that come from? Why do you feel that way? 
And then, wow. you know, it opens up to, oh, well, maybe this happened in childhood. I got bullied. I got called this and that because of my skin tone. And, you know, or this guy said he didn't want to date me because I was dark or, you know, like these kind of situations. And when you see, you start, it starts painting a picture and it starts putting together a timeline of how did this develop and how did this thought process grow about yourself? And now you have this internal messaging that says, I'm not as desired. I'm not as lovable because of this. And we have to do a lot of like reworking around that because we know that that's not true, but we know what the messaging was. And so we have to be able to really unpack and pull back those layers. And it's really like a, because, you know, it's an institutionalized systemic issue, right? Like this is a, it's beyond like the individual level. It goes into the, yes. you know, the whole, like we got to go all the way back. We got to go back centuries to where this even started. So it's kind of like, you know, we put that education there and that awareness say, hey, something's not, whew, sorry y'all, <laughs> something's not right um, with this messaging. And we need to be able to find some ways to, empower you to embrace um your skin tone and being able to challenge some of that messaging because you know it is harmful Mm -hmm. that's wow yeah so much um, um, yeah right i and i wanted to speak with tynesha about you talked about the other end of the spectrum Mm -hmm. can you expound on you know, maybe somebody in the comments or something, or just, you know, maybe you're, you're not black enough or anything. And then like, how, yeah, how- yeah. Um, I think it's tricky. So from that regard on social media, people will again, question my blackness or as people like to say nowadays, a preference. I don't mm-hmm. know if you guys hear that term a lot, mm-hmm. but oh, a preference, a preference. And so I think a lot of my viewpoints I don't know if they're taken as seriously from the perspective of women who may have experienced colorism because they feel like I have preferential treatment. But I will say just kind of listening to Tierra and hearing that that perspective of things, it does remind me to try to give people grace because I think when colorism comes up, some of the things that people who might be on the lighter side of the paper bag test, they (laughs) might say, um, well, you know, like I understand that you're frustrated that society, men, whoever, they might have treated you a certain kind of way because of your skin tone. But I also get frustrated because that gets taken out on me and I didn't do anything to you, right? Mm -hmm. And so I try not to internalize people who might have negative viewpoints or things like that. But you see it a lot. Like you'll see women in the comments and they're like, Oh, light-skinned women, they don't show up for y'all. That's who y'all like. And they age poorly, you know, the black cracks, like all type of things. And I'm just like, goodness, there's so much ugliness that happens. And so I think in in my childhood, it's sad because it's like, yes, women who are darker complected definitely do face bullying. I saw it all the time growing up. But on the opposite side, in high school, I struggled to make friends. I was very quiet and everything, but I didn't have friends. And I felt like I faced a lot of hate never bullying, but just a lot of hate or negative feelings because of my appearance. So you have that side of things too, where I'm experiencing some form of bullying or discrimination from you. And I want to connect with you because we're both black, but I'm not getting that. So we're, we're both seeing the impacts of colorism, but in different ways. Mm-hmm. And Sabrina, I want to talk, I want to speak with you and your field of work and being an educator, and how does colorism play out uh, in your line of work? Well, um, I'll say this. There's a long history of how colorism, in, especially in uh, uh, urban communities, Black communities, um, communities of color, how they have played a huge impact in who has had access to education. Um, obviously, we know that uh, for millennia, um, the Western world has tried to divorce the the enlightenment from African people. And then for the last several uh, you know, centuries here in America, um, for the overwhelming majority of it, uh, black people were not allowed to be educated at all. Um, however, we also know the travails of 
slavery and post-slavery lifestyles that created Creole people, lighter skinned people. Um, and those people were able to access uh, certain means more easily than others did. And we still see that trickling down in classrooms today, whether it's how we perceive actions and behaviors and what that looks like, how we interpret it between uh, lighter skinned students and darker skinned students. There have been dozens of studies that show that darker skinned students are more uh, likely to be referred for behavioral problems. They are less likely to be given uh, certain types of educational attention that would be uh, aligned with giftedness. Um, they they are not offered as much sympathy or compassion when it comes to uh, certain issues that they may deal with and even the way that they may present themselves or, you know, whether it's the way that they're dressed, right? I went to a high school where we all had to wear a uniform, but how it looks on a lighter skinned body is always seen as more akin to being in, you know, proper or more uh, put together than how it is on darker skinned bodies. Uh, and so all of that impacts what types of jobs you get. Are, are teachers going to call on you to be the school representative? Are you going to be able to get all of these special incentives and fellowships and partnerships? Um, because you have a face that looks educated. You have a presence that, that symbolizes education. And here in America, that aligns itself with whiteness 100%. And so the closer you are to that aesthetic, of course, they just interpret everything you are and everything you do differently. And as a child, there's nothing, you, you're not even aware, right, that this is happening to you. But over time, you become used to that preferential treatment. And now when you get to high school and college, this is something that's almost kind of baked into your DNA in a similar way that white privilege is. And we don't see it until it's called out. And then we have to be you know, accountable for, for the realities of the situation. And even as an educator and a mother of four children who are along the spectrum in skin colors, I have to make sure that I am incredibly intentional about celebrating each and every one of my children for all that they are, every variance in their skin color and their hair and their eyes and the way that they're shaped, letting them know that they are all equally beautiful, 1000%. Um, so I'll just stop there for now. <laughs> yeah, it's it goes really deep. And uh, I wanted to ask also, because I was just speaking with Tynesha and she was talking about her experience um, being lighter, uh, lighter complexion, right? And how did that play out maybe for you in high school or even in childhood? Like, do you feel like maybe you had preferential treatment or you was it never an issue? I know for a fact I did, both in my family, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and uh, in educational spaces, religious spaces in my community, right? And don't get me wrong, there was like this, there was this weirdness about it as well. Right, because yeah, she light skinned, but maybe if y'all look at them childhood pictures of me, I was bald here. So it's like you light skinned. Why don't you have long curly hair like other light skinned girls? Cause I'm black. What do you mean? Like my hair? It looked like my grandma's hair. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with my hair? Nothing wrong with my hair. Yeah. So that was a small piece of, that made me feel insecure about both my blackness and my skin color. But for the overwhelming majority of my life. The overwhelming majority of my experiences have been being put on the forefront, being at the front of the stage, being in front of the class and intelligence. Absolutely. Right. Ninety nine percentile in every test. And I'm, I'm not going to knock the fact that I deserved um, some of the spaces that I was in. But there were also people who were just as talented than me, as me and people who were ta way more talented than me in other areas who were not offered the opportunities they should have gotten because the way I presented, namely before I even opened my mouth, was so closely aligned with whiteness and, and intelligence and things like that. Um, whether it's um, being, you know, student ambassador, you know, um, for my, you know, middle school and going doing speech arts competitions all over the city. Um, in high school, uh, Chicago Public School sent me to the Bahamas to do some work. Like it was like 
a, a whole bunch of stuff that I'm like, I'm sitting here looking at one of my good friends who's a, a darker skinned young man who's incredibly talented as an artist. He can draw like nobody's business, but nobody ever pays attention to him. Nobody yeah. ever says he's not a he's not a bad student. He doesn't disrupt, but nobody ever calls on him. I have the the this white man who I love to death, who I love to death, who is the dean of the fine arts department picking on me to do everything artistic. And I am a dancer, yes. And I am a singer, yes. And I'm an actor, yes. So absolutely, I'm going to take advantage of all these opportunities. Well, what about my counterparts? What about them? They wrong too. Why they can't go? What is it about them that makes them any different from me? We from the same neighborhood. Mm. We got the same issues. Mm. We got the same type of parents. What is it about mm. me that makes me more presentable? And it's obvious when I look at everybody else who was in my echelon is of talent and, and, you know, just general academic wherewithal. It mm. was my skin color first. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, how was your experience here? Uh, did we get to speak about your experience maybe uh, from childhood to adulthood? Um, I well, oh, you, you weren't talking to me. I, I, my brain. I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh my personal experience I really if I did I don't know because I'd say my skin I'm kind of in the middle I think I'd be more like brown like brown skin yeah know. we have so many different shades I don't, but I would say I'm <laughs> so somewhere dope. in the middle um so I don't it was neither like here or there um for me but it was definitely things that I observed and noticed um in childhood and just like those subliminal messages um you know, that you'd get like growing up, like, uh, you know, don't stay outside too long in the sun, you'll get darker, you know, those kinds of things, you hear those things. Um, so it's just, you know, things I definitely observed and noticed. Um, but as far as like being here or there, I, I'd say I'm in the middle. I don't know how it would be if I was on, you know, further on this side of the spectrum or that side of the spectrum. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you, Jason? I mean, as far as experiencing any type of like colorism, yeah, um, quite sure. Um, I'm a, it was never, I never really just noticed it per se, um, but I'm pretty sure that I've experienced some type of it. Um, uh, I was an educator for uh, five years. I taught there in the fourth grade, uh, reading language arts, and um, I can definitely uh, identify with Sabrina as far as um, the way that uh, a lot of the students are treated. Um, we had a we had one particular young lady and um, she kind of favored Sabrina a little bit. Her name was Bianca, pretty little girl. And um, all the other girls used to really pick on her assertion saying that uh, she was too good, uh, think you better than everybody else and stuff like that. And uh, Bianca was very intelligent, very smart, uh, always excelled, always made great grades. And we had another young lady, same type of skin complexion, her name was Sanaya, and they would try their best to fit in. And that kind of like springs forth to the question that I wanted to ask. Uh, uh, pretty much all three of you guys, um, uh, with emphasis on uh, uh, Tanisha and Sabrina, um, I know oftentimes when you look at people that are uh, in the uh, mulatto, as far as, um, I don't want to say half three because that sounds disrespectful, but um, half white, half black or whatever, um, they have the a complexion and the conundrum of um, not being accepted on one side and being accepted on the other side or trying to prove themselves on one side and being accepted on the other side. And it was always a, um, a situation where they would try to fit in. And that's what they wasn't good enough on the black side and they wasn't good enough on the white side and they would try to fit in. So um, that any type of uh, situation that you guys may have endured, uh, Awesome. Yeah. So um, one thing I was thinking about while we were having this conversation is um, it was a particular scene on School Days. The movie came out, I believe, in 1988. Um, I was like eight years old, telling my age. Um, however, um, there was a scene that you had the uh, wannabes, which were uh, the light skin, uh, which was led by Tisha Campbell. And you had the Jigaboos, which was led by, I believe, I believe she was one of the Jigaboos, one of the uh, ladies that played on um the Tyler Perry movies mm -hmm. can't remember her name per se. However, um, I done a uh, I done a little research on that, and I was actually watching uh, the movie, and it was along with the commentary from Spike Lee, 
And uh, some of the things that he said, it was really amusing. He said that um, uh, throughout the filming, uh, what they did is they put the wannabes in a upscale, nice hotel. And they put the jigger, uh, a, a hostel, if you know what a hostel is, like a, a bad hotel. And so um, they had, uh, the wannabes had, you know, five-star service. The Jigaboos had five-star service. And I mean, not not Jigab not uh, five-star service. I'm sorry, I'm talking too fast. And um, Spike Lee said that he did that intentionally. And so uh -huh. what happened was, um, I don't know if you remember the scene where there was a fight mm -hmm. uh, during, the, uh, during the step show mm -hmm. uh, home for homecoming. That was actually real because the uh -huh. people really just angry because you know this um partiality was happening and so um i guess what i was getting at is that um uh, this is really like a real thing and um and uh i was going to actually share a clip of um the um the actual scene between them two and everything is just it, it was just a really uh surreal thing that um when i saw the commentary about it and yeah that's how i want to share mm -hmm. yeah the classic movie right yeah, everybody's seen School Days. Absolutely, one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, I know every song and every dance. <laughs> Sabrina, it seems like something is brewing. I'm listening. No, I mean, it's. I mean, you think of the year, right? It's it's eighty eight. Mm -hmm. We're only twenty ish years removed from a uh, segregated South. This movie takes place in an HBCU, most of which are in the segregated South, where there's a long, long history of that division um, between uh, dark, darker skin, black, lighter skin, black. that's just the reality of the situation. I literally just spent the weekend with my grandmother in Phoenix who spit me out, face. The only thing that's different is the hair. Like everything, we are completely alike. And, each and every way. And she's reminding me, don't you go out in that sun. Don't you go out in that sun. Don't you go out. And she's the lightest of all of her siblings. And she was treated differently than all of her siblings. Um, and that impacted the choices that she was able to make, uh, the ways that she was able to recover from mistakes um, and, and really bad choices that she made. Um, it impacted her relationships with her siblings and with other people, but also the real the reality that she is black impacts how she sees herself, impacts how she sees white people and other lighter skinned people. Um, it, 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 it impacted how she treated me versus my other cousins who are all darker. It impacts how she treats my children um, and how she treats and and I and it's 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 so embedded in our culture, especially as it regards relationships. I have had the unfortunate privilege of being chosen because I was light skin, as opposed to this person who might have actually wanted to be with this person or wanted this person's attention. Um, and it's, it's it disgusts me every time. Um, mm -hmm. But at the but at the same time, you also have to have that real conversation of the line between self-hate and preference, because a lot of people are starting to have that conversation nowadays. Like, is it do I have to hate myself or is it just a preference? Especially when if when the roles are reversed, we are now in a season where darker skinned men are calling the shots. OK, mm. <laughs> 30, 40 years ago, that wasn't the case. The bar and them was up. Yes, now sir. nobody checking for them no more. Nobody. Right? Being light skin, being light skinned and a man is associated with femininity almost, softness, mm -hmm. right? So it kind of works in the reverse for them. And it's like everybody, every, every woman want them tall, dark, and handsome. But yeah. is that self-hate for me to want a dark skinned man? So why would I look at a man and say it's self-hate for him to want me because I'm light skinned? Mm. I don't know. I, you know what? And, and since we're here, I want to jump on that with, with relationships. Uh, and Tierra, let me know, uh, how do you feel about dating and, and, and colorism? And even do, do you even have a personal preference? Like, does it does it matter in, in today's society as far as dating and stuff like that? And what have your dating experiences been like uh, as far as like 
the color spectrum, you know, do you have a certain preference or? Ooh, there is so much to say about this one because um, it, it brings up the other like the sub group of colorism, which is gendered colorism. Um, and it's an it's been interesting to kind of see because in media spaces, darker skinned men are preferred mm -hmm. um, in entertainment, things like that. But, you know, maybe just day to day darker skinned men are also perceived to they have that perception of being more dangerous. They get um, longer prison sentences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um all of that sexuality mm -hmm. that too that too and so and then you know the opposite side of that with the lighter skinned women being um more you know seen as more feminine um submissive all of these things easier to deal with all of that compared to the images and the messaging of a darker skinned woman um and so where that has like the opposite message and so we're, we see these like breakdowns happening and all of these meshes being brought into picking a partner and it's all pretty skewed, right? Because then you're missing so much based on, you know, skin tone mm. that, and when you think about it, like, you know, we have such a broad range of skin tones as black people, but somehow we've kind of been categorized in like two, maybe three categories. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, <laughs> But it, it leaks over into the dating world and how that impacts relationships and things like that. Um, it's interesting to see. And, and, you know, it brings up a, that interesting conversation of preference um, and, oh, well, I prefer this or but that brings it back to what is your intention, though? Right. And what are your intentions behind that? Where does that preference come from? Where is it really stemming from? Um, is it true uh, because you find this skin tone to be more attractive or is it that you are looking at the other side of the spectrum as more negative? And so you want to be over here, like maybe somebody preferring a lighter skinned woman. Is it that you really find this lighter skinned woman attractive or is it something about her being more palatable to whiteness that you are really more drawn to because it makes you feel a certain way? Mm -hmm. So it's it really goes back to some intention of peeling back the layer of okay, what is what is it really and where is it really coming from? Mm -hmm. Um, in my personal experiences with dating, yeah. Um I have found myself to be a little, little drawn to my little darker, you know what I'm saying? A little melanin. <laughs> um because I'm like, well, like they're they're really beautiful. I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh, like you know, but truly, um <laughs> But truly, but I'm open to, you know, all skin tone like that. And, you know, Sean knows this because, you know, my me being divorced and, you know, trying things out, being out here dating and everything. I'm like, oh, OK, we see what's out here. We see what's up. So yeah, it's great. <laughs> just a little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. That's that's interesting. And I, I want to speak with uh, Tynesha as, as well as Sabrina in that area. But I do. Uh, and then I also had a revelation not too long ago. Uh, and I think I've never spoken about this before. So this will be a first um, for everybody to hear. But first, I want to talk about today's sponsors, Love Fearlessly, uh, Stripping Labels. Uh, we talk about love and loving yourself. And my wife actually created a whole card deck, Love Fearlessly and Stripping Labels. And what does God, like, how, how does God see you opposed to what uh, culture and society says in these labels? We need to take off the labels and really know who we are, because I think a lot of times we struggle with knowing who we are opposed to putting labels that culture and society has placed on us. So love fearlessly stripping labels. Uh, I'll have some more information below in the description. All right. I want to give my revelation that I got maybe, um, maybe a week or two ago. So here we go. This is the first. This is the first. <laughs> I realized uh, my mom is maybe Tierra's complexion. Yeah, about Tierra's complexion. My ex-wife is the same complexion. My wife now is the same complexion. And I realized that I had this preference 
And the, wow. yeah, but here's the thing. Dark skinned women has been phenomenal to me my whole life. I cannot recall one bad situation where a dark skinned woman treated me bad. They have always treated me like a king. I can't recall one bad situation, but I always revert back to a certain color. And I was just like, wow. I, I, I guess that played out in my own personal life without me even knowing. So I don't know if it was maybe just because my mom was that complexion and I just kind of stayed with that. Or is it that maybe I looked at darker skinned women, you know, maybe like, OK, they cool, but that's not my my style. So I don't know. But I, I just thought that that was an interesting dynamic, considering how well dark skinned women have treated me throughout my whole life. I would imagine I probably would have been married to one by now, but I'm not. So I thought that was interesting um, upon this topic. So anyway, um, Tanisha, uh, can you uh, give us your dating experience and do you have a preference? <laughs> yeah, you know, I think it's uh, interesting just thinking about what we said within the past few minutes. The difference for me, I would say between a preference and it actually being some form of discrimination is if I attach a personality to whatever preference I have. So that can go to a multitude of things, but specifically with skin tone, I think we see that a lot. And some people, I mean, I've heard some men, even though I know they say, you know, light-skinned women are always preferred. They say light-skinned women have a horrible attitude. We're stuck up. We're conceited. You know, we're all about ourselves. So we're not good partners, right? So those are some things that people really attribute. And it's not just a preference, right? So you're not just embracing or appreciating darker skin because it's beautiful it's because you feel like the other side has all these negative characteristics so that's something that I have to catch within myself mm -hmm. to answer your question I I've, I've definitely dated lighter skin and darker skin mm -hmm. it, I have a joke though so I, I do prefer darker skin men um <laughs> And it's so funny because like, you know how Drake says acting light skin, that ties into what we said, we're light skinned men. You're like, oh my God, they're like very self-centered. They want to be the woman in the relationship. This is why I'm like dealing with them, right? So these are things that I say with my friends as a joke, but then I'm like, maybe that's not, maybe that's not the right thing for me to say. So I definitely do have some of those viewpoints as well, mm -hmm. but it's interesting for me because my mother, she is several shades lighter than me. So if you saw my mom, mm -hmm. you would probably think, I was, I'm inclined to say albino, but she doesn't have albino features, but she's that light. Yeah. And so growing up, she was picked on for her skin tone. So she intentionally dated men who are darker. So my father is a darker skinned man because she wanted us to have color. So growing up for me, the messages were different. It wasn't like, you know, light skin is, is great. She actually wanted us to have more color because that was her trauma. So I think we also should reflect on, you know, our parents, their experiences. What did that look like? Because it definitely does shape what we view to be beautiful, what we gravitate toward as adults. Wow, man, this is this is really good. I'm, I'm enjoying this conversation. I really am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very layered. It go, it goes very deep. It's very rarely that when you think about skin tone, especially in our community, but in society as a whole, it's never just I like this because it looks good. There's usually some underlying tone. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing is, I know your overarching question is, you know, is colorism still a thing? Can we move on from this? And I really don't think we'll ever get to a point where it's fully eradicated. It's kind of like racism. You know, it's so ingrained in our society where we can be aware of it. And I do think that especially when you're benefiting from privileges like mm -hmm. this, you should have self-awareness and speak out on it. But it's not even just the Black community. You look at India, you look in DR versus Haiti, like it's in mm -hmm. so many different cultures that I, I really don't think that we can unlearn it. But also, I don't think that the people who have privilege will be willing to let it go. Uh, mm -hmm. Bars. <laughs> <laughs> what are, What are your your thoughts, Sabrina? Um, I mean, I have to. Say, I have to. I have to. I don't know. I'm. I'm contending with that with that thought in my mind because I have two daughters, and one is uh, a darker skin like her father my ex-husband and the other is a spitting image of me and 
it got to a point where we raised them to be so in love with their blackness that <laughs> my darker skinned children would make fun of my lighter skinned children mm -hmm. because they were less mel melanated. Okay. And so we had to reverse some of that conversation and help them understand that it it's not that simple, right? It's 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 it doesn't work like that. Everybody in this family is just as black as everybody else. Y'all got the same gene pool. <laughs> Y'all can't same mama, same daddy. We're <laughs> not gonna do that, right? <laughs> um on the flip side, like when I say my daughter's my my one of my daughters is a spitting image of me, hair, body, face, everything. And my other daughter is a spitting image of her father, hair, body, face, everything. And so when, when my darker skinned daughter was born, she was a baby doll. Everybody loved her because she had this beautiful brown skin and this curly hair. And they would be like, how does she have that hair? They would look at my hair and be like, how does she have that hair? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know these things. And, and I raised them to appreciate their hair. Now, both of my daughters are locked, just like mom. And they have, they, their locks look totally different because they have two different grades of hair. And those locks are sitting on two different bodies and two different faces. Um, and, I, and I fear, you know, a world where my daughter, who's like me, when she does all of this, because that's what she do now. She, girl, she's six. Girl, <laughs> who was you talking to, girl? When she does all of that, it's funny and it's cute. But if my brown skinned daughter does that, it's disrespectful. Mm. I can't, I can't settle for a world like that. I can't settle for a world where both of my daughters, who are equally brilliant and talented, where my lighter skinned daughter, who's only a year younger than her sister, um, where doors are more available for her. I I can't, I don't know, I can't, I'm, I'm just not okay with that. That hurts in my spirit, right? That hurts in my soul. Now, when I was uh, 16 and I prayed to God and I said, God, I don't even want to be married, but if you send them, number one on the list is Jesus. He got to love Jesus. Number two, he got to be dark. <laughs> Did, was that my list? And that's all I was looking for in college? in that order right yes absolutely okay and it was for no other reason than i just thought it was beautiful they were darker skin men were beautiful to me yeah growing up i had a crush on orlando bloom who was who was white yeah. uh -huh. i had a crush on shamar moore right but jay boog was my man who? jerrell demonte houston was my man me too okay <laughs> period <laughs> okay who did y'all say yeah for him okay um and of course i you know dated or went out with a varying array but in my heart and soul there was no other option and i ain't gonna lie part of that was because i wanted to birth a beautiful brown baby and raise that brown baby in a world it, that was better than the one i grew up in and raise them to have a better view of self than the ones my some of my family members experienced and some of my friends experienced. Um, so I definitely identify with your mother, uh, Tynesha, in her choices. Um, and I, I, in my in my soul, in my spirit, no, I don't know if I could. Colorism has to. It got to go away. Eventually, we got to realize that everybody is equally as effed up and everybody needs equal amount of grace. And you can be soft or you can be hard. You can be dumb as a box of rocks or you can be smart. And it has absolutely nothing to do with the color of your skin. Wow. Um, like you said, preference absolutely should be uh, attached more to just what you visualize and what you like over attaching it to other uh, characteristics and virtues. That's not how how any of this should work, right? Um, but I think, moreover, I don't want to say we shouldn't see color, mm -hmm. but we should get to a point where we celebrate 
all of the colors mm -hmm. in all of its beauty and glory. We celebrate all of the hair textures in all of their beauty and glory. We celebrate all of the features, the curves or lack thereof, right? Mm -hmm. All of it should be celebrated mm -hmm. in all its glory because all of us, I'm a Christian, by the way. All of us was made in God's image. What nobody less made in God's image. Mm -hmm. it, all of us was. Mm -hmm. So I just, I can't, that can't sit with me. I, I'm not going, I can't, I'm not satisfied with that. I'm not satisfied with that. It got to go. It got to. Yeah. So let me ask this because not, I, I, I hear what you're saying, Sabrina and, 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 and Tanisha, I hear what you're saying about your mom. So I wonder how many women actually think about that. As far as will my baby come out <laughs> this color or that color? Because I remember growing up, uh, and, and maybe I'm telling my age that people would say when the baby come out, they would say if the ear was brown, they knew what the color they knew yep. what ultimate color <laughs> the baby would be. And I was just like, I guess that's really a thing, you know? Oh, he oh, his his ear dark. So he's going to be, he's going to be chocolate. And I was just like, oh, wow. You know, and I guess they kind of, I guess people kind of put that baby already, I mean, fresh out the womb, like maybe putting judgments on the baby fresh out the womb. You know? Mm -hmm. So I wonder if, uh, if women think of, of, of that, like if I'm going to be with a, you know, maybe I, I choose to be with a darker man. So my baby won't have to deal with this or that. i uh, mm -hmm. I never thought about that until you said it, Tanisha. Yeah, I think men do it too. I mean, I know they do. I've seen, I've had conversations about this on my platform. And uh, one of the comments that stood out to me was a man who's darker complected. And so he said he's very intentional about dating women who are either light complected or outside of the black community because he doesn't want his children to go through the same things that he did. So mm -hmm. yes, you know, I think it operates on both sides, you know, whether you are insecure about being lighter, darker, or also if you're a man or a woman. Yeah, one of my battle buddies that I was in the military with, um, he's a, um, a white guy, and um, we like, right as a friends. And um, he's like one of those white guys that, you know, is hip with the culture, like, you know. And so um, later on, he actually dated one of the um, uh, girls that was in our place. She was a black girl. And he he told me, like, right off the, right off the rip, like, look, you know, um, I want a, a, a black woman to for my kids to look a certain way. So mm -hmm. definitely men think that way. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in the entertainment industry think like that too. A whole lot. Have entertainment whole lot of politics is huge. Oh, yeah. politics is huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. That's, yeah. My mind is blown right now because I, and I guess for me, I, 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 I didn't, I didn't think for me personally, I, I never really thought about that. I was kind of more concerned, like, oh, is my baby going to have a hairline? You know, how long is hairline going to be around? You know, that's what I was I was worried about. I wasn't too much worried about what he looked like. I was, you know, hopefully he can be, you know, a little taller than me, you know. Uh, oh, my God. That That's what I was a little uh, concerned about. But that's that's I guess that's a whole different dynamic. Um because I want to be respectful of of your all uh, of your time, uh, everyone. Can you give me uh, some closing comments or maybe some inspiration to someone maybe who uh, you know might be struggling with with uh, skin complexion? Like, what would be your words of wisdom? What kind of advice would you give someone who's listening to this or maybe even seeing it? I mean, there's no wrong answer. Uh, let's start with you, Tier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think um, being able to really unpack the and be, being able to acknowledge, you know, the implicit biases, the subconscious and being able to bring it to the conscious mind. Right. A lot of these things that we're, you know, talking about as far as, you know, these thoughts about like, you know, going out of the sun, what, you know, what skin tone your baby's going to be like, all of these things are coming from a place of these subconscious biases and this messaging that has been inundated into our society uh, for centuries and centuries and centuries, right? Mm -hmm. um, and while colorism didn't start with us, um, it can begin to end with us. And I think a big uh -huh. part of that too is being able to, how can we protect ourselves against the effects of colorism? And I think that starts with, you know, having these conversations um, and for people that are impacted on a, the negative side of colorism, 
Um, you know, definitely like positive affirmations around skin tone, um, resistance to some of this uh, programming and this messaging um, that is being put out um, and how we can begin to empower others in our communities um, when it comes to skin tone. And um, like uh, Sabrina was saying about how can we can celebrate each other um, and being able to be intentional about and bring awareness to the division that has been placed um, within our community, right? Because that was on purpose. Like what the hell <laughs> what the hell this all got started, right? So when we bring that into our awareness, when we say, hold on, wait a minute, this doesn't really belong to us for real. We can actually fight this system somehow. It might not be completely eradicated altogether, but the more we begin to talk about this in our communities, um, the more we bring awareness to it, the more we can call it out and okay. say, uh-uh, this, the, like, we have to make changes because we have to be able to acknowledge the psychological impact that this is ha ha having on our people. Mm. And when we are being able to acknowledge that psychological impact that's happening to our people, we can also begin to resist that, begin to fight against it, begin to combat it, begin to challenge it. Um, and that brings up more questions, more self-awareness, more insight, more introspection. Mm -hmm. And it also brings about more acceptance of us as Black people mm -hmm. and being able to truly um, come together. And so I think um, that's where we can you know, begin to start. It's continue to have conversations like this. Yes, for mm. sure. Wow. Yeah. Tierra, can, can you also let everyone know how they can get in touch with you? Give us all your information. Uh, anyone who want to contact you, I'll have it in the description, but we mm -hmm. would also like to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you can find me on Therapy with Tia um, on Instagram. Um, my LinkedIn is Tierra Faulkner. Um, I'm a licensed mental health therapist servicing those who live in the states of Illinois and now Tennessee. So, um, yeah, you can always find me on those platforms. Awesome. Awesome. And we got to uh, we got to get you uh, putting out some more tweets because I've been retweeting your stuff and, and, and I need you to get some more content on Twitter. <laughs> I, I looked at a few of them, too. That, that was really good. <laughs> yeah, I've been tweeted all your stuff. So we need some more tweets from you. <laughs> um Tanisha, uh, yeah, so words of wisdom and let everyone know how they can get in touch with you. Yes, yeah, so I totally agree that conversations like this, they need to keep happening. Kind of like what we said before, I feel like sometimes you feel uncomfortable and I'll even be transparent. I hit Sean up and I'm like, okay, so what are we talking about? Like, what questions are you gonna ask? And I never do that for most of the content that I do, but the fact that I was a little bit iffy about can I speak on this how is it going to be received I think we need to push past that level of uncomfortability and have conversations like this and mm -hmm. I think self-awareness is key right so that can be whether you have your own biases about people who have a different skin tone than you or if you have insecurities within yourself and figuring out where that comes from when you know why you're operating in the manner that you do, I think you are more prone to give grace to other people. So I encourage everyone to really just have those moments of reflection and talk to people, talk to your brown skin friends. If you're brown skin, talk to your light skin friends, understand the experiences that we're having because in most cases, even though we focus on our differences so much in this society, a lot of us have shared experiences. There's some sort of commonalities. And I think people just want a safe space. They want to feel respected, even though I might not have your experience. I want to understand it. And I want you to feel like you can come to me. Aww. So just normalizing transparency, which is definitely what my platform is all about. Um, so where you guys can find me, my YouTube is Tynesha Talk. So my name, the way it is on the screen. And my Instagram is Tynesha underscore Renee. So if you like discussions like these, again, difficult conversations that need to be had, check me out. Mm, for sure. Yeah, because when you hit me on the DM, I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> Ty not going to work with me. I was thinking, I said, she ain't going to do it. <laughs> I waited <didn't> like that. <laughs> yeah, I was like, no, no, I can't do that to me. <laughs> but I'm glad you... Um, I'm glad that you were open and, and honest about that. And uh, I appreciate that. And uh, fighting through all this stuff that we had to get through tonight, we still made it. So that's what's up. I appreciate it. Yeah. Sabrina, what are your closing thoughts? And where can we find you? Uh, as an educator, my number one thing for us is that 
this ain't going to Nobody can solve this for us but us. Let's start there. Mm. It is not up to white people who own white media to put more representation on that TV screen. That's not it. We have to educate ourselves and our children, those that we bore and those that we are given access to. We, it is up to us. Y'all, we in our 30s and 40s. It's us. It ain't them no more. It ain't mom. It ain't mamas and daddies and aunties. It's we the mamas, the daddies, the aunties, the uncles now. It is us. We have to educate ourselves on the history and the present of our people because we are still African people, even though we are estranged from home. And, and when we realize the breadth of beauty that exists still to this day and has always existed on the continent, I think that will really empower us to have a more um, educated, spiritual, um, and connected ideology of identity within ourselves. So much of our self-hate is directly connected to the way that Africa was painted as barbarism and cannibalistic and simple and uncivilized and, and uneducated. Um there are still millions of African-Americans to this day who have absolutely no idea the amount of industry and technology and wisdom and spirituality and truth and eternal beauty that existed and still exists mm -hmm. amongst African people. And because we have divorced ourselves from that and we have no history, M Malcolm X said it bad, you ain't got no history, you ain't got nothing. You don't have anything. All we have is America and what America says about who we are. Mm -hmm. And that ain't going to work. That ain't going to work. Mm -hmm. This place, this land was not built with the, all the variations of who we are in mind. That's why we just now getting foundation that, that actually works for us. <laughs> it, like, it, it wasn't built for us. The clothes wasn't built for us. That's why we just now getting jeans that can fit us right. <laughs> it wasn't built for us. And we have to be reminded of all of the things. Because if generational curses are real, real so, are, so is generational wealth and generational peace and, and giftedness. All of that is just as real. But if we don't understand the generations, then we ain't got nothing but the curse of slavery and Jim Crow. That's all we get. Mm. But we get way we get millennia more. Got way more than that, y'all. And so we have to educate ourselves. So that when we see Sheba and when we see the Ethiopians and when we see the Nigerians and when we see the Moroccans and when we see the Ghanaians um, of history, when we see Benin and we see Mansa Musa, we think us. That's us. That's us. That's me. That's who I am. Mm. And if they did it, I can too. And if they believed it, I can too. And if that's who they are, that's who I am. And we can walk in it. And then we are more able to celebrate each other despite our differences. So yeah, I, um, educate yourselves. And if you don't know how to educate yourself, then you can find educators like me. <laughs> you find me on Instagram at she.unapologetic. Um, I am... I do all the things all the time. I'm a poet. I'm an artist. I'm, I sing... I, I be talking sometimes. I be kicking it with people on the internet. I just do whatever feels good <laughs> in the moment. Um, and I just like to share my life with people and invite people to share their lives with me and live their lives in the most unapologetically authentic way possible. So you can find me on um, Instagram at she unapologetic, she dot unapologetic. Um, I am on YouTube too for fake, but it's going to be for real in 2024. Just you watch. <laughs> um, that's she dot do everything. Mm -hmm. Um and, and yeah. Yeah. If you find me on them, you'll find me anywhere. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna hold you to that. You. I'm hold you to that. And and uh Tanisha does videos too, so we'll make sure we we expect some some uploads from you. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> Jason, closing words. And they, where can everybody find you? Pretty much summed everything up, man. I'm I'm just I'm full right now. This was really good. Uh, I'm glad we all got to come together and just share our thoughts on this. Um, this is something out of me to do for a while. Um, when I brought it to my brother, John, uh, you know, we were, um, he was very apprehensive about it. And 
let's jump on it took us a little bit but you know we got to it and i i actually want to do a continuation um of this strongly that this is going to get a really good um uh, going to be a really good outcome i really think a lot of people are going to uh, hone in on this and uh, watch this uh because this is something that is very um uh, paramount and big in our community man and um it's just to you know give any words of wisdom man i you know again educate ourselves man uh, have greater self-awareness of um of us you know as and just uh continue to love on yourself more and uh, reach one and teach one um, you know um education is big and that's pretty much it man yeah I, I was thinking while everybody was talking man i was just saying what if um uh Kim would have heard this uh, podcast before she made all those different uh, transitions and stuff like that, man. When I saw the picture of her in the comparisons, it mm -hmm. really sat in my heart because that is that that is a perfect example of what you would see of self hate, and and because she was a beautiful woman, you know, where all those uh, different cosmetic surgeries happen, and so man. Oh, we need to have more discussions like this. Oh, you talking about Lil Kim? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you were cutting out. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff I want to say. I, I'm not. I'll say that for another time. And uh, maybe we'll. You know, there's some other celebrities that I'm mad at. I'm like, why? Why are you doing this? Um, by yeah. that alone, I Which, want to do I'm another gonna... recording too. But I want to get some men on here. And yeah. Talk to some brothers about this as well. So, uh, yeah. ladies, thank you all for your time. I appreciate you all. Thanks again, Jason. Um. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. You you can find me at uh Jackson Heights own. Oh that's yeah. my uh Instagram name. Like the uh movie coming to America, Jackson Heights underscore own. So yeah. Yeah, Stand up, coming to America. I love this. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, and, uh, and that's a that's kind of a topic too. Uh, but anyway. Yeah, so thank you all once again for joining me. And uh if you see this on youtube or when you see it on youtube i would love to hear what you have to say by leaving a comment below uh, we will get back to you we will respond uh, if you are listening to this via podcast we'd love to hear your comments as well leave a rating and review on apple Podcasts. Uh, this is sean heineman and i've had the honor to connect with some phenomenal women and thanks again jason phenomenal. yes we are out <laughs>